However, <clears throat> as I start coding and retrieving and running reports, I may see that I'm missing themes that I thought I had coded for and I haven't. And that brings in sort of one of our advanced coding tools, um, which is auto coding that I want to show you. Auto coding is a facility to literally let you search through your data and attach codes automatically. So, um, and again, it works on this concept of the selected cases. So before I actually go into autocode, I want to go back here and make sure I have all my cases selected, all my codes selected. Now I'm going to go to codes and autocode. It shows me here's all my cases with my source material associated with them. Um, if I didn't, if they weren't all listed here, I could add or remove ones that I wanted to set up. Um, now I go to the phrases, which is what I want to search for. And I actually want to search on the word home or house or estate or a series of synonyms like that. Because I, I want to look for themes where they're talking about what their, what their expected home life is like. So here's a few of the keywords that I'm going to go for. I can say what chunk of text I want to grab wherever I find one of those keywords. For example, I want to get the one paragraph before that and up to one paragraph of text after that. So I have some context associated with the code. I can then go over here to the codes tab and say I want to code this with a new code called We'll call it home life. Click OK. Select that new code. And now if I click the auto code button, it's literally going to search all eight of those interviews, or it could be 800 of those interviews. It will search the entire text for any of those phrases, any of those three words that I typed in. And anywhere where it sees that word, it will grab the paragraph before that word and the paragraph after that word, so basically the paragraph surrounding that word, um, and attach the code home life to it. And it'll do that automatically. So I click OK. It tells me it added 16 new codes to my study. All right. And then I can start, I can browse to them. Right? I, can, I can go back through here to my first case, and I can start looking at them. Or I could use, again, that filtering capability to come down here and do a filter by name and just filter to home life, uh, and then start going back and review those codes. And I can review them just by clicking on them. And when I click on a code on the, on the uh, case card, right, in the study window, with view source checked down here, it will automatically display that over in the source. It will open the source window, open the source, and show me where that code is. So I can start going through those codes, looking at them, and then I may decide well, you know, um, this whole paragraph doesn't represent that. Really, it's, it's just uh, uh, this first couple sentences. So I might go in there, and I could uh, then come back over to my code window, take home wife, and apply that to add a more refined code to my, to my um, study. And then I could proceed on in reviewing these codes um, and determining which ones I wanted. If I decided, well, I just recoded that one to a more precise paragraph, I don't need that one anymore, I can actually go to the code menu and delete it from there. Um, I actually have easier ways I could do that. I can uh, control click or right click, control click on a Macintosh, or command click on a Macintosh, excuse me, uh, or right-click on a Windows machine to access these context-sensitive menus to do various tasks associated with codes as well. Um, <clears throat> so autocoding gives you a facility to uh, uh, rapidly code your data, and then uh, using the mechanisms that I've shown you with filtering um, and with browsing through your case information and your source information, it can allow you to do these iterative paths to review and refine your coding material using reports 
and the filtering mechanisms to retrieve the data, you can get your data out, and those operations represent your basic code and retrieve process within Hyper Research. At this point, uh, I'll open it up. If there's any questions that anyone has, I'd be happy to take or answer further questions associated with it. Does at least tell me, does that make sense for folks? Yes, it does. I'm very happy to hear that. That's much appreciated. So bear with me here while I, I just sort of read through some of the comments that folks are sending me to make sure I uh, uh, can answer anyone's questions that they have. Um, uh, so yes, it is. Uh, so uh, there is kind of an embedded philosophy here. You can do complete grounded theory in hyper research where you literally just start opening up your source materials and you begin coding them. Um, with no predispositions, no thoughts as to how your data should be organized, and by uh, moving stuff around, because you can select not just one K, you know, code at a time, but I could literally select all the codes on a given case card and copy them to a different case. So it's fairly easy to reorganize your material as you go along. Um, so you don't have to have a structure thought out beforehand when you begin your hyper research study. However, uh, we come from a school even in the field of qualitative research where it's our opinion that in any kind of research, quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods, having a decent study design before you go out to collect your data, before you begin analyzing it, is, is, a, is a good practice. Ha even if it's just a you know, half a page outline of a plan um, having some kind of plan as to how you're going to approach your research design up front is useful. So we'd you don't have to have a structure, but we'd strongly encourage that you do take the upfront time to think about the structure of your data and information and how you want to analyze it, what your key research questions are before you begin um, uh, actual coding. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that a number of people found this useful enough they're going to be upgrading to the latest version. Um, uh, oh yes, uh, repeating questions, uh, someone reminded me I should repeat the question. So I had one question about, you know, how that I just answered, which is, should you basically uh, think about the design of your study up front? And again, you don't have to, but we strongly encourage that you do think of your design up front. Uh, got another question, what formats does the newer version open? Uh, the newer version, uh, the main difference is in uh, text documents. Um, uh, the Hyper Research 2.8.3 uh, and earlier only open basic text files. Hyper Research 3.0 will open rich text, so RTF files. You can save Microsoft Word documents as RTF files. Um, it will also open HTML documents, um, so you can get rich text. It also supports Unicode for international languages, so you can have Arabic and Chinese and Cyrillic, Russian, and all you know sorts of different languages are now supported as source files. And uh, uh, I'm disinclined to announce future products, but uh, a little later this summer, uh, we will be providing 3.1 as a free upgrade to people who are registered owners of 3.0, which will let you open Open Office and Microsoft Word documents directly. So. Um, that's coming shortly. Um, uh, same question sort of about video files and audio file formats. A couple questions on those. Uh, the range of formats is a lot. I, I couldn't enumerate them all off the top of my head. Uh, if you go to the FAQ, the facts section, frequently asked questions section on our website um, under support, uh, there, there is a FAQ that discusses the audio and video formats in detail. It's a wide range. It's basically a, a, all the formats that QuickTime um, supports. Um, we do sometimes get uh, people who, uh, for example, uh, bought a digital recording device that recorded in, you know, WAV, Windows Audio File Format or whatever, and, uh, and that's not one that QuickTime supports, although there's plenty of free tools for converting formats. Um, but 
I do recommend if you haven't started a study and you're planning on capturing a lot of material in audio or video records, um, that you look first at what formats are supported uh, and then make sure that your recording device is set to record in those formats. Almost all digital recording devices will do more than one format. For example, many of the ones that will by default do WAV files uh, for audio will also do MP3, um, which is supported by QuickTime. So often it's just a setting to do in advance, and then you're recording directly in a format that's immediately importable into the tools. Um, if you need to transcribe those audio or video files, I'll put a little plug in that ResearchWare also makes an excellent transcription tool called HyperTranscribe um, that will let you transcribe, help you transcribe files. It's not an automatic machine translation. It is a, you know, you listen to it and, and retype it. Um, I think I've covered all the questions, folks. If there's no other questions, I want to thank you all very much for attending this webinar. Uh, I had one question from the beginning, which is, what's the new, next upcoming webinars that we will be uh, offering? Um, uh, and uh, the, the answer to that is, uh, we will be repeating this seminar um, and uh, uh, with different presenters uh, off and on over the rest of the summer months. So there will be repeat opportunities. We will be introducing an, a, a sort of advanced uh, features, which will talk about frequency reports and our theory builder, which I didn't even touch on today, um, that we'll be offering. And we're open to any other suggestions that people want to uh, email us or contact us um, that you would like to see. If there's uh, an area of how to apply the package or area of qualitative research you'd like us to run a webinar on, um, we're that flexible um, that we will uh, take those ideas and, uh, and set up webinars to suit. You can always find our current events, uh, whatever they are, um, by checking the events section of our website under under news menu, um, there's uh, uh, an uh, events of interest. And uh, I'm just reminded by a staff member here who's online that you can also request specific dates and times for webinars and chats, and we have enough flexibility that we'll actually uh, adjust schedules to sort of tailor them to people's preferential times. So again, um, if there's no other questions, I would like to thank you all for coming. And this will bring our, uh, our webinar to a conclusion. Um, thank you all very, very much.